came about, uh, I'm another ex share of validation, but uh, part of the validation process these days is um, we're now having to look at your ethical considerations as part of the new validation process. So I'm going to read out something first, which uh, Leanne and Kate Geary wrote from CIFA, explaining why it's all come about. So, CIFA accreditation is how archaeologists demonstrate to their clients, employees, employers, sorry, peers and the public, they have knowledge, skills and integrity to meet professional standards and to deliver value to society. Working to professional standards requires professional competence. Archaeologists need to be technically skilled and they need to understand and apply ethical principles to their work. These ethical principles are set out in the Code of Conduct and the standards of technical competence form the basis of the competence matrix for which all applications for accreditation are measured against. The competence matrix has been amended to include specific reference to the need to work in accordance... Sorry, that one? Here we go. Uh, mm. with the uh, Code of Conduct and CIFA standards and to be familiar with guidance relevant to the applicant's work. The changes aren't about memorising the code. We want to test the way applicants approach ethical issues they may face, how they balance different perspectives and stakeholder expectations and the techniques they use to make sound ethical decisions. To help applicants and members who may be supporting them understand the new requirements, we want to develop case studies and examples relevant to the different areas of practice. So we're asking the special interest groups in particular to think about ethical issues that are relevant to their specialist areas so we can create scenarios and examples that applicants can identify with. The Code of Conduct places a duty on members to conduct their work in such a way that reliable information about the past may be acquired and to ensure that the results are properly recorded. Members may have a responsibility for making available the results of archaeological work with reasonable dispatch. CIFA standards takes this further by requiring in many, but not all, cases. The deposition of an ordered accessible archive. Sorry. And as yet we know that archiving is frequently an underfunded and the time poor just uh, adjunct, I can't even say the word, adjunct to a project not the central consideration that guidance advises it should be, which in itself creates a number of ethical issues. Archiving as part of the process of archaeological research and investigation creates a wealth of material for ethical case studies and training scenarios. Selection strategies, retention and discard policies, balancing the objectives of the current project with the potential for future research in line with Code Rules 2.2 and 3.6, Reporting, confidentiality and accessibility all provide potential issues, conflicting priorities and perspectives which archaeologists, whether archive specialists or not, may need to navigate. We have a collection of resources on the website which needs to be supplemented with guidance and resources for the specialist areas of archaeology. Uh, there may also be opportunities to publish think pieces in the archaeologist in our professional pathways bulletins we support members upgrading their accreditation. Contributors are always sought, and if finding the time to write an article sounds too daunting, recording an interview is an alternative. Now, so this came about because uh, as a committee, uh, we've been asked to help with the new guidelines for the archive side of it. So currently, this is what we, on the archives member level, it says, so we need for that to change to pull in uh, ethical issues and our professional miss, I can't really think of the word. Our sorry, our perception of professional context is how that now reads. So, this is planned to be a discussion. I'm going to bring up some things and my thoughts about it, because I want you to all do the work, basically. Uh, so that we can have some thoughts about it. Uh, so I know, for example, I've spoken to a few people about some of the things that are coming up already uh, and how we have different opinions uh, and whether or not we can solve these. So discussion points are going to be transfer title, yay, including GDPR issues, selection discard of fines and where we want to dispose of these fines, uh, what happens with the archives that have no home, how human remains are cared for, and what standards should be followed. 
So, GDPR. So I, I thought I'd better put in some funny pictures because it's not the funniest of uh, talks otherwise. Right. So, chance of the title. Hopefully, with Duncan's new brilliance, uh, we might get this sort of sorted eventually, but at the moment it's still an issue. We still have issues getting chance of the title. Uh, and it is an ethical thing because some of it is to do with GDPR as well. Uh, we have to go, uh, the consultant's very important in this role, but sometimes it's difficult to go through a consultant. I'm not saying anything against consultants here because they have their role as well. However, ethically, if we can't get hold of a consultant to get the chance of a title, then that's an issue. Uh, how many letters should we send before we give up and say, is, as a lot of us, uh, a lot of contractors I know say, after the third letter, if you send the third letter recorded and you get no response, then a lot of museums will accept that as a fact that you've tried, that, you heard that, that the attempt has been made to get to that transfer of title. Again, are we, are we then hitting ethical issues about the fact we actually haven't still got the transfer of title in place? Um, what do we, and as Duncan said, a lot of these are, uh, and Nikki was saying, a lot of these we've got old archives where we still can't get hold of transfer of title. How do we do this? And trying to find owners. And can we put the names of landowners in an archive? And how are we to comply with this legally and ethically? And this is the same thing. So, has anyone got any thoughts? This could be interesting, but we haven't got any microphone to run around with in the stage one. So do we have any, has anyone got any thoughts on this side of any ethical considerations that we need to think about or legal things or professional? Here you go. Thank you. I just wanted to say, like, if... Because we've got lots of legacy archives, and if um, you were... Uh, take you, you, we've sort of got that archive in our stores and if we were going to give it to a museum is there something that we could do for the transfer that would say you know it's still in the care of a different museum but if the owner came and said I want all my fines back could they with some sort of agreement with the museum get them back if they wanted to? Um, see, I've, I've, like Nikki, I don't think I've ever tried that I think we Basically, after the third one, I'm not sure because I'm not sure that museums. I'm not sure that some museums would do that. Yeah, maybe. we have I, got museum people here. As to I don't whether think or not museums can do that, can they? It's against their collection policy. I assume, yeah, that's true. Yeah, mm. because basically you're just using the museum as a store, free yeah. store. Yeah, so. if you do that, yeah. So I think, so I would say it's difficult because I've thought about that because I've handed over archives mm. and thought, well, what happens now if the landowner in three years' time says, oh, by the way, I don't know. My, I, I, I forgot about them or something like that. Uh, I want them back. I'm not sure then what a museum would do. Has it's just, um, for us, it's just like we've got these things in store, but they're not being cared for perhaps yeah. as they should be, so yeah. they'd be better off at a museum. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so it's they, tricky. There's then a risk and, and a cost to that museum that yeah. they may not long-term benefit from. So I can quite see why a museum would refuse them. Mm. And I think it would be in their ethical interests to refuse them. It's not yeah. the ethical interest of the object, perhaps, but yeah. for the museum for the it museum, would be. Yeah. I, I just think we tie ourselves in knots over it, to be honest with you. I mean, if you found a bike and you advertised in the paper and you did all the rest of it and then no one came for it, I think it's your bike. I don't understand why we worry so much <laughs> about all of this, to be honest. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm going to back as well. Oh. Uh, the, the problem is museums cannot accession anything into their collections unless they own it mm. and they won't accept things they cannot accession so my my advice would be for the for, for a contracting organization in this position to claim ownership of the material and to to deposit it with the museum transferring ownership from them to the museum and if the museum accepts that you are after a period of time now the legal owners of that material, then the transfer can go ahead. And I think that would be lovely if you weren't a charity. Because there's charitable issues with ownership. Oh, well. So someone in the back, gentlemen. Oh, and then another lady. <laughs> <laughs>
The, the problem with the bike analogy is you know whose bike it is and you've taken it. It's a, you're in a legal position where you've done an excavation, you've taken the objects from the farmer or the landowner's field with his consent in some way because you've gone onto the land, then you've got to legally give them back to him or get transfer of title. It's not your property at all. Thank you. Whereas the bike you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Can we have a lady who was in the sure. second row here? Is there any precedence for uh, writing a WSI, for example, to say if the landowner doesn't come back to you within a certain number of years, mm -hmm. that at that case it then belongs to the company that has done the excavation and then they can legally sign it over? to a museum if they wish? I think some units are loath to take ownership of... We can't, because yeah. we're a charity, so it becomes an asset and there's a limit of what we can have as an asset. Mm -hmm. well, what the, uh, the deed of transfer that we've drawn up with the solicitors says is it has a clause in it. That it but essentially the process is the landowner signs a deed of transfer which says that, in principle, they are happy for the archive, the material archive, to go to a repository. In between, they expect to be told what's been found and to have the opportunity to agree again that the material can go to a repository. But if they don't respond, having been sent that information, then the, pro the transfer will go ahead and they will rescind their legal right to ownership. Yeah. 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 So all of, all of that only requires the signature of the landowner, nobody else. So not even the repository has to sign it. So it's basically the landowner saying, I agree to this, you send me a list of, of the material archive, catalogue of the material archive, I will review that and I'll agree again or not. And, and then if they agree, the transfer can go ahead. If, they, if you don't hear from them, the transfer could go ahead, or they can say, no, I want to keep it all. And that's the crucial bit of the deal. Yeah. Isn't the template that will be released when you have it signed up? Yeah. I think right. Uh, yeah, I'm going to OK, so the other point of that is putting the names of people in the archive. Uh, oh, yeah. So uh, potentially, oh, oh yeah, sorry. So uh, in this one, potentially the, uh, the landowner's name is not within the research data, but within the administrative package. And then because that is required legally, that's completely within GDPR, as long as that data that you're holding about that, uh, that person is relevant to that uh, situation. So that is, should be completely fine. Right. Okay, not on our head. Okay. I don't think so, because it's all part of a legal con 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 contract. Oh, right, yeah, so. There you go. I don't know. To go back to no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, I think, yeah, it would be. It like a, yeah. Because on, on, our, on our transfer paperwork that we do, we say this will only be seen by us and the museum for people, for people to sign over. And it's where you store that data whilst you're keeping it, whilst yeah. the archive is. Yeah, it's public. Yeah, it's public information. Yeah, but, 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 Uh, whether allowed to, and, they, uh, and do we need our site? So I ended up trying to find a photo and thought I'd better put a photo of me in because I didn't want to break, to upset anyone. So, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, actually. So, so do other archaeological units leave photos of their staff in without any photo consents? We recently did an opt-out for all the staff, so we, 
we said, are you happy? And if not, contact us and we'll take you out of everything. And we only had two staff that, and we then took them out of everything. So that's how we did that. Yeah, because ours is, ours is small, so we're talking like 50 people. <laughs> um, the volunteers, are all they all sign consent forms and photo release forms, so the similar thing. I'm a little bit closer with that, because I think there's something in the contracts when staff start, but with volunteers, obviously, it's different. So that's what we do, but I don't know, if, don't know how bright that is. <laughs> I don't know about the GDPR issues on that, but I would say we always, there always used to be staff photos in archives and they were infinitely more interesting okay. to look at. Yeah. And I think we have lost something by the loss of individuals in an archive. Now it's very much a factual thing. And I do yeah. think, well, I'm not saying I know the answer. <laughs> I'm saying that I feel like there is something lost oh, in no, our I'm very good. factual yeah. archives and they're very professional and brilliant, but there used to be the pictures and the site vehicles and the huts and the people standing around chatting on site and it was and you saw people's names and we don't do that anymore and I think that is a loss in another way no, but I, I don't know I what agree. that is. I mean I like the fact there's photos yeah. of people and Absolutely. site huts. Right. But then if you have somebody who maybe has just escaped an abusive relationship yeah. and their picture then appears digitally because it's going online and then when it was buried in a box on a slide that maybe three archaeologists saw in the rest of its life that's a bit different how it is now where it can go on digital yeah. and all sorts of things. Yeah, true. I, I think Vicky's idea is, especially as you say, if you're a slightly smaller unit of getting people to sign something over might be the option. And, and we didn't have a problem like that. We didn't have a number of staff who had something gone on Okay, so, so yeah. this is something that will be discussed later on, but the selection and discard of finds, and this is more about where we, dis not so much the actual selection process, but where we dispose of the unwanted finds, because this is something that came up uh, in discussion, I was discussing something with another unit the other day, and we were talking about, uh, if people don't want them, they don't want to go back to the landowner, and we've got boxes of skips for uh, is it ethical to dump them in a skip or in a landfill and get rid of them that way because they might or they might end up on the field and that would then um, contaminate future research possibly but we, you can't really dump them in a skip or do you put them in a bin and things like that and it's more so what's ethical and what sort of things should we decide to do with them Uh, if, if you follow the uh, Museums Association um, deaccessioning guidance, which is a handy grid, um, it culminates in permanent destruction. So you, essentially, if you want to deaccession an object in a museum collection, you follow this path. And if you find that nobody actually wants anything, any, it wants this, this uh, object, you have to destroy it. In, the, in terms of archaeological material, that would probably mean putting it through a pulverizer. Um, however, on the other side of that, Helen Wickstead at Kingston University initiated a, uh, which some of you might have seen in the CIFA magazine, the archaeologist, uh, 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 initiated a program of recycling unwanted archaeological material. Uh, by handing it over free to schools, to people who wanted to lay a patio, to anybody who wanted to come and collect a bucket full of uh, Roman building material or whatever, they could come and come and pick it up from her lock-up in South London. Um, it sort of didn't quite get off the ground because of the pandemic, but that's an alternative. So more programmes like that might be an answer, but if not, you have to destroy it. Well, this is a question I asked Lorraine actually a long time ago because, you know, you're busy deselecting material after you've recovered it from site when it's not yours. So it should be going back to the true owner of that material. But obviously they're not going to want it. So you tell me. Isn't there another point about... Uh, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. What was the point before yours, Duncan? <laughs> <laughs> 
pulverising. <laughs> pulverising. Oh, oh no, the recycling thing. If, if you're sort of recycling material amongst the community, is there not a danger that your fines might then be incorporated in another context yeah. by, through which they might be misinterpreted in the future? Well, that's why you can mark it. Well, I suppose it's if you think, yeah, I mean, you're not going to mark 20 sacks of pottery if you know you're not going to keep it. Well, then you have to pulverise it. Then you have to pulverise it. <laughs> Costs. Well, you have the cost of that, yeah. 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 No, but you said that, that says, and if, and if you don't want it, we don't want it, we can pulverise it. Um, just based on the community, like getting what Duncan was saying about getting people from the community to come and take some of the items, um, there was an artist who came in to the archives at Mola who was the landowner at the time an excavation was done. She wanted to see the material, but she was showing us pictures of stuff that she's collected from the foreshore and she's got Roman shoes and pottery and things like that. And she wants to do a project with museums where she turns that into some contextual artwork of the timeline that it's gone through um, and wanted people to look at the different stuff. So that might be one way that you could do it and make it a creative outlet that different people can get involved in so that it's not going to end up in a, a new context accidentally, but it's still being used for something that relates back to the archaeology. We're going to end up with an awful lot of artists <laughs> or artwork around this. I don't know how many artists there are that want to use that unwanted material. My idea, I worked on the A14, and we had six tonnes of spare Roman pottery at the end, nearly, was I'd like, wanted to bury it under the next road, which is the A428. <laughs> and clearly, it would have been made good aggregate. There's a saving there somewhere. But nobody's going to dig up the A428 and think, oh, what, there was Romans living beside Saxons 20 years ago. Sadly, we didn't get the, the post-excavation done in time to get it under the road. But that was my <laughs> proposal what anyway. What have you done with it? Yeah. Pardon? What have you done with it? It's still being analysed. <laughs> there is precedent that the Jacobites broke down Hadrian's wall to use it as didn't Yeah. Oh, so put it under HS2, that's the answer. <laughs> put it down to training. And then the next project, we'll get the next one. OK. Uh, this is the, uh, again, hopefully this will all be sorted. See, hopefully all these will be sorted when Duncan's magic store appears in how many years. <laughs> um, what should happen with an archive that has no home? Uh, paper and, and fines. I mean, that, that, there are obviously people like uh, Lorraine has large numbers of stuff that's amongst to go to Kent and people like... Uh, a lot of people have archives. I mean, we're quite lucky. We don't have huge archives at Albion that need to go anywhere soon, but I know a lot of archaeological units have very large archives that have nowhere to go. What should we do with them? Some people suggest that after five years we should say, oh, forget it. Uh, which we can't do, ethically. And, th and this is another ethical question. What do we do with them ethically? Do we just keep having... Do contractors have to keep paying to keep them? I know there are, uh, there are arguments that said, well, you shouldn't have taken the job in the first place, but some people take the job and then find there's no archive, that the archive's closed in that time. So, and that's retrospective anyway. It's all very well saying, well, you shouldn't have taken the job in the first place. People have taken the job. They are stuck with these archives. What should we be doing with them? Uh, it is unprofessional to dispose of them. Yes, I think so. Any other, any points on that? Okay. Uh, we also, we've had jobs that we've done. We've done the field work and then we've never been, got the money. So the report didn't get written. They've got nowhere to go and, or they've gone, yeah. um, gone bankrupt. Something's happened that's meant it cannot be completed. What do you do with those? Uh, any answers? Has anyone got any answers? I any? Got <laughs> and keep them. Huh? We wish. You're, you're sort of between a rock and a hard place because if you're dealing strictly commercially, 
no, you shouldn't keep that because it's against your commercial interest to do so. And, and theoretically, we cannot afford to do it in, in a, ad infinitum. But on the other hand, as you say, it's very unprofessional, unethical to, to dispose of it. There are things, uh, there's not a total solution, but you can review what you've got after a certain time and see whether there's anything that which could be rationalised. And that's what we've been doing for some of our Kent archives. But that's the smaller stuff. That doesn't answer the question about the bigger archives. Um, we have had some success with unpaid archives where we've had um, volunteers who've worked on marking the finds and making the finds records and then we've worked out deals with museums where it's deposited for a much smaller charge with a broader sort of mini report just to give them sort of like a rundown of what's there but it is a lot of backwards and forwards and time and discussions with museums. And sometimes they're completely a no. <laughs> um, and we do have shelves of finds that we have no clue. But some museums we've got deals with who will take an archive without a report as long as they have the rest of the documents and it's prepared up to standards to a point that you can afford. Uh, we offer them to the universities to use as projects for master's students um, and then they will produce a report either for us or for a museum and hopefully after that stage we will review whether a museum will accept a university deposition of the archive but it tends to be for the bigger archives which will actually make a proper project not a single box of finds and a couple of pieces of paper. I mean, we could tie in there one one thing is it, it isn't just contractors that have the issue for example I think we were discussing a meeting with um, universities hold on to archives and what are they going to do with them and things like that. If they close, if that, when Sheffield disappears, they're going to have lots of archives and what are they going to do with them if there's I, 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 A, nowhere to keep them or B, what do they end up, end up having to do with getting them to standard and things like that. So this is another issue. Which, uh, I mean, at the moment we're mostly talking as contractors, but there are other people that will have to be involved that have to be involved in this sort of process. Okay. Ah, no. Humour remains. This is uh, uh, something actually, because Sam and I were discussing it the other day uh, when we spoke. Um, there's two things. There's getting the licence. Uh, and something that has come up when I've been talking to other contractors is the renewal. Um, you go into your thing and you suddenly find that your licence ran out. In theory, you should have deposited it three years ago and your licence still says it will be deposited by 2010. And you look at it and think, uh-oh. <laughs> so you then have to go back and get a deferral, um, as we discovered. I think I've got a few to go back and sort out. Again, it's an issue over... Yeah, licences and what you do with them and the fact that you have to make sure that you keep an eye on them. I know that, Nikki, they have a, you have a burial. You have people keeping an eye on all yours, don't you? So you have it all on a system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I mean, I don't know. I mean, every, everyone, hopefully, I'm not even so hopefully. Hopefully everyone here isn't like us and found that we suddenly find burial licences that are out of date. Uh, I think it's really tricky because it kind of sprang up on people. I don't think it was something that was an issue and then it became an issue. Yeah, and I think part of it was, there was that period, wasn't there, where the they, they basically, the yeah. issue was they just said, uh, you've got to, you can't do anything with it type of thing. There was no way you could deposit it. And then I think things all sort of fell apart. There's also the awkward bit where you suddenly discover that you've got a dead person in amongst your animal bone that you didn't know yeah, was so a dead you person when you dug the up. You, you don't need a licence yeah. for that. So, yeah. um, and then, okay, so has anyone got any views on the licensing side, apart from the fact that it was a problem? <laughs> on that, you need a deferral. I spoke to the... Yeah, I think I've done... So you've got a deferral, it's not a licence, because they won't retrospectively issue a licence, but you still yeah. have to get a letter from them to say so that yeah. you can deposit it. Well, no one unit that found that they had so many, they sent a list of all the ones and they gave them one, one deferral for the whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, yeah. and then this is it. Yeah. Uh, this came up because we were certainly... We were, uh, I was discussing with Sam, which is 
should human bone be marked? Now, according to lots of guidelines and to standards, it says it should. When I went to a conference the other day and I spoke to some museums and I spoke to contractors, most contractors and most, mu most museums I spoke to said they didn't want human bone marked because it wasn't ethical. Uh, and I think, so I think it's an interesting one because some people are saying we should, uh, as we said, standards say that we should be marking it. I spoke to a lot of museums, and I spoke to one museum who said, it's in our guidelines to mark it, but we don't want it marked. We don't think it's ethical. Come on, I'll make that one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, our, our human remains person said definitely not, but unfortunately a lot of the guidance was written by Simon Mays at, uh, and, and he insists that human bone has to be marked. Our specialists suggest that you only mark stuff if you take it out of the collection, if you want to sample it, for example, you mark it as a means of identification. But otherwise, no, I don't think it should be. Disarticulated bone, yes, not articulated bone. Any other views on that? I think Sam, because oh, Sam was the one we had a conversation on the phone the other day about it. I don't particularly have a view. My issue is that all the current standards say you should. Even the SMA standards issued very, very, very recently say you should. And the reason it came up was because we've been working with museums. Some want it, some don't, whether, you know, whichever way as a side of the line you're on, because it is quite contentious. I think um, the standards, the current standards, most up to date say you should mark it and it's reversible and this is this three layer thing that's all well and good because it's reversible but as a museum dictating that to a unit that requires those um you know those fume cages because of the stuff you use so are they we therefore dictating that units should invest in these really expensive fumigation units and also that's three lots of marking so that's the time on it as well so i I don't think it's as, it's straightforward. And if all the standards say we should be doing it, well, what? Which one is it? Do, are people making their own mind up? And one unit got in touch and said, for reasons they didn't want to do it ethically. Okay, and their suggestion was to get around the issues of because I think I raised issues of uh, bones being jumbled together, unmarked bones being found in boxes. What were they? Um, specialists using collections, which quite frankly they get laid out on tables and they have got moved together and they've got jumbled. I have got many examples of this, and if the bones had been marked, it would have made life a lot easier, putting the, the human remains back together. And their response was, if the museum wants them marked, the museum could do all the marking, which sounded a bit like passing the book to me. So I don't, so I, you know, I just don't think it's straightforward. I, I, you know, I don't think we've got an answer. I don't know if anyone does. Do you have an answer, Duncan? No, I don't have an answer, but I'm, I'm beginning to think that this isn't an ethical issue. I mean, is, if it's not ethical to mark human remains, is it ethical to excavate them? And, and is it ethical to put them in bags in boxes? Or is it ethical to sample them for scientific analysis? We do all of those things, so why shouldn't we mark them? It's, it sounds to me as, as if some people are trying to get out of marking them because they don't think they will, because it's too expensive. Uh, and museums, I'm not understanding why museums say they shouldn't be marked if they're happy to have them in their collections in the first place. So this, there is no answer to this question at the moment, Helen, because we don't know the ethics of what we're doing with human remains at all, is what I would say. Um, OK, well, that was just whether each person should have a separate box. Uh, it's mainly if there's like one or two bones, I think we were, we should, you, you can probably put more than one person in the box. It's just that some museums, okay, oh, not museums, sorry. Some people have said that you should always just have one person in a box, but if you've only got one leg. No, they don't like each other. <laughs> <laughs> They'll learn to like each other after a few years. And this is partly, the next slide is partly what you were saying, Duncan. In museums, what you did, uh, uh, so should the remains actually be displayed? In, this partly came about from the SMA conference the other day when we went to it, and th this was something that, that we were discussing, wasn't it? Whether uh, was it Nottingham Museum had done a, a questionnaire of their visitors about whether uh, human remains should be on display or not, and whether they should be kept. Uh, if they're not being displayed in museums, should they be actually even be kept in the stores, and should they not just be reburied? Um, and does it? And this was something that came up: is did it make any dif Does it make any difference if they're cremation? Because some people think, well, that's not a human body; it's only a bunch of ash or bits. 
and they don't see it as human or being on display. Uh, or the age of the bird, because I think there's something else they said that, well, I think the, the Nottingham Museum uh, question said, well, if it's, only, if it's 200 years, uh, only 200 years old, then it's fine. If it's older than that, then it's not. Uh, or does it matter whether they're disarticulated or just random bones as to whether they're on display or kept? I don't know how many museum people are here. I know a couple. Uh, or whether anyone has any views on this side. Yeah. <laughs> Making day <Dave> work. <laughs> um, one thing that I have considered, partly through my academic career, I did my master's in human osteology. Um, and I think I'm it doesn't come up very often, but religious respects and cultural respects should be some consideration, I feel, because in different countries there are different um, ideas and beliefs about what happens to a person's soul, so to speak, once they have passed away. And in Canada, I know it's a massive issue because uh, First Nations Canadians believe that your soul stays with your body. So there's a, a massive push to have the um, remains repatriated with individuals of that community. So I think things like that need to be taken in consider into consideration if the provenance of the remains can be determined. Better way to do because I think I'm over, over time, I think. Uh, OK. Are any other professional issues or professional ethical issues surrounding archiving? And the only ones I came up with is that you've got to show that when you're working with external <coughs> colleagues, internal colleagues or public and landowners, that you're being professional towards them, that you're taking their points of view, that if you're working with, if the contractor's working with a museum, that you're following what they're saying or you're following guidelines and things like this. Uh, and you've got internal colleagues, obviously you've still got to be professional with all your internal colleagues if you've got conflicts of interest with them or conflicts of interest going on. Uh, and dealing with the public and landowners, that is always, I mean, as we say, it's making sure that when you're writing to the landowner saying, would you like to hand over your fines, you're not just saying, oi, hand over your fines, but you're explaining why or things like this. Uh, and how can, coming back to the original reason that we're doing this, how can we show validation committee that we are professional and ethical as, archive, as people working in archives? So... If anyone has any views about that, uh, or quickly, and then or have a think about it, and if you can, you can email me, or you can email the committee, or email the committee, and then we can, <coughs> as a committee, this is going to be because Sam's now the chair, so this is up to her really. We, as a committee, can help help inform for the new validation thing. So I, I'll be there as well, but we'll all be there. We won't just be you. <laughs> But this will be something that we all want to look at as a committee so that we can inform uh, Leanne about how we want to help word the new validation. Okay, uh, that's it. Good.